So I'm mixing up a bit of Bannock here. Um, and it's believed that Bannock was, uh, the Bannock that I'm making, was uh, actually brought over from Scotland in the 18th century. And in fact, they didn't use flour. Uh, the original Bannocks were made from oats or barley. Um, anyway, it was brought over here, and it's believed that the, it was invented, if you would, in, in Europe. However, the indigenous peoples on this continent, long before European continent, made bread so that they take the rhizome, the roots of ferns and cattails, uh, that would give them the starches. They'd mix that with cornmeal, etc., and I suspect they, they baked that on, on hot rocks. So, I don't think, you know, it's, it's an ongoing argument who invented Bannock, but the form of Bannock that I'm making did become a staple of indigenous peoples on this continent. And not so much by choice at the start, however, they adapted to it very quickly. And if you think about um, the natives as they were forced off their lands, and, and I emphasize two words, their lands, um, they ended up ha requiring rations from the government, at least in Canada. I believe in the States as well. And these rations included flour, lard, baking powder, uh, salt. So essentially the ingredients that I'm mixing up here today. Uh, if it had not been for those rations, because it's a really rich carbohydrate food, it's easy to make, it, you can do it on a trail, we use it on our canoe trips. Um, so it's an excellent survival food. And uh, if it weren't for that, a lot of natives would have simply starved. Uh, in that time period. And I'm going to mix this up, get it in my hot skillet over there by the fire, and uh, I'm going to be dipping this in some maple syrup. It's going to be a grand breakfast, just a grand breakfast. So the word bannock comes from the word bannock, and I'm sure there's some Scottish fellow out there who's going to Correct me on my pronunciation of it, um, uh, and and the meaning of it means morsel. And when these guys are done, they're going to be tasty, tasty morsels indeed. So I'm experimenting more and more with the foods and the recipes that they had in the time frame that we portray, which is mid 1700s. So that was authentic uh, brine cured pork I used this morning, and uh, <laughs> I should have rinsed it a few more times because it was awful salty. Anyway, the natives called that fat back, and they absolutely hated that meat. And uh, sadly, on uh, a lot of the uh, uh, reservations for rations or residential schools, that was the meat because it was the cheapest for the government to acquire. And uh, anyway, a sad bit of history there. Anyway, I've got to get back to cooking these guys up and see if I can do a better job in my first portion of the breakfast. Pretty easy to see why this became um, one of the most common foods of the uh, 17, 18, well into the 1900s uh, for the native people, obviously, but for uh, voyageurs, for fur trappers, for the prospectors, well into the mountain man era in um, west of the Rocky Mountains um, from 1810 to 1840, one of the more common foods. It was lightweight, um, it was easy to prepare in the trail, but most importantly, it was full of carbohydrates. So it was a really high energy food that if that's all they had, it would keep me going for the day. Anyway, my day after I finished this, and at least half of my breakfast turned out good, um, I'm gonna add a little more maple syrup to it. That's something they might have had um, back then. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm gonna be splitting out some ribs for my canoe today. And uh, we're going to get some of that done before spring, and then, and uh, yeah, looking forward to a canoe build in the spring.
So I decided before I would uh, start on my birch bark canoe build that I would uh, take a look around in some new hunting ground. Um, so uh, in about five days, the muzzleloader only season starts in our area and I've been given permission to hunt on some new ground. So I was out looking about for sign and lo and behold, I come across this well. So the area that we're in uh, was settled between the 1820s and 1830s. In fact, a lot of the farmers in this area that were deeded land were, or at least some of them were veterans of the War of 1812. Anyway, when they were looking for a site, obviously the prime sites were on running water. So if you had a creek or a river running through your property, in those days, you didn't have to worry about the quality of the water. You had water for husbandry and yourselves and all the needs. Um, so it's essential. Um, and there's a lot of first person accounts of um, say the Kellys had a really good, strong flowing spring on their property of good tasting water and neighbors that were within walking distance uh, would come to get their water there. But at some point they'd dig a well and it was, it was a necessity, but there was also a lot of danger associated with it. So if you can visualize <laughs> this soil is glacial ridden from the, from the retreat of the last ice age and it's, it's hard clay soil to boot. So if you're gonna undertake digging a well, such as we're looking at here, um, it's daunting and I don't mind hard work, but the thought of me having to start this project, well, it, 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 I find it overwhelming actually. Anyway, the, the process they used, and it was quite dangerous. They would dig down, they, they'd, I, I've read where they'd put a wagon wheel around it to get that perfect circle. Um, so a four foot iron off a wheel if they had it. Uh, and then they'd start and they'd dig down as far as they could with a pickaxe and shovel. And they could no longer do that. They'd put a ladder down in, down in they'd go. And they'd, they'd actually cut their, or half their pickaxes and shovels with half handles uh, and spud bars. And then they'd set a derrick up on the top, like a tripod. Or if they were lucky enough to have a large pulley, they'd set up two, put a shaft across with a large pulley and a stout rope and down it would go and they'd have a bucket on either end of it. So the fella down in the hole, that poor fella, he'd fill the, hole, he'd fill the one bucket fellow up above because you had to have help he'd pull up the full bucket at the same time the low, the empty bucket was going down um, number of first person accounts um, well i found two at least that date to the early 1800s of people that were killed in the process so maybe the they had uh, uh, inadequate rope or the spindle broke on the pulley and a full load of stone and rock would go down on the poor fellow's head and kill him once they were done, they would, and found water, they'd try to get down to the aquifer. When water started to seep in, they'd put stone on the bottom to just above that aquifer, and then they'd completely line by dry laying rock the well. And all finished, they'd use that rope to, <laughs> to climb, scamper back out of that hole once they get down. And there are numerous accounts of wells being up to 75 feet deep. So a dangerous task, but one had to have water. And that old saying, uh, if you think about it, when I was a kid growing up in the farm, they'd go, don't waste the water. I'd heard my mother say that a hundred times. And, and you didn't waste water. They grew up in an area you wasted nothing. So they would use, um, they'd use the bath water. They'd all bath in it. And when they were done that, they'd wash the floor with the bath water. And they were done that, they'd water the garden with the leftover water from the bath water. So they didn't waste anything and certainly not water. Anyway, really interesting find for me today. Uh, now I'm going to go find some deer sign, and then I'm finally going to get at uh, starting that birch bark canoe. So I'm finding lots of uh, buck scrapes here. Um, so essentially what happens is the, the, the buck during the rut uh, will go along and he'll he'll scour up the ground and then he urinates on it and it's the smells the pheromones and what have you that attract the does and i found about three now they're not many yards apart and i'm going to keep heading this way uh but i'd say given that this hasn't been disturbed in a few nights that maybe the rut's over or uh, or at least it's winding down but the real advantage of this area that i'm going to hunt in is uh it hasn't been hunted at all this fall so um, all those guys with their modern um Mo or their water modern, modern rifles have not uh, impacted this area yet. So I'm going to keep looking around. I got got to get at my canoe. 
so I found another one and I've only walked about 30 paces so it, it was really active during the rut again this one hasn't been disturbed for a day or two so I suspect the rut is is almost over but we're gonna keep looking and yet another um, this one's actually got some fresh tracks in it and they're pretty big so there's a there's a big fellow in here also found a couple of buck uh, rubs and what they do is that during the rut they rub their antlers on trees so if it's a tiny little fork buck or say a four pointer or a six pointer they pick pretty tiny trees well I found one back there that was a substantial tree which means a substantial deer anyway this could be a good spot for us in a week So I'm about to get at splitting out the ribs and the sheathing for our canoe build for our next uh, next spring. And and I, I'll get the gunnels and the thwarts, everything done. So all the bits and pieces. But before I start, I need to make a couple of tools. And uh, so this is a maul that I'm going to use on a fro that I forged out on the blacksmith shop. And on this guy, I mounted a hickory handle. But for this tool, which is what I'm driving this with when I'm splitting out the ribs, uh, I made it out of ironwood or another common name is hop horn beam. So it's a very dense wood. And it always fascinates me, the our pioneers, how resourceful they were. So if they needed something, they just made it. And and I found over the years making my own tools that um, it, you know you're done, not with how the tool looks, but how the tool feels. So when it gets to the point that it doesn't feel like something in your hand, but feels like an extension of your hand, um, you know you're done. So this guy feels pretty good. The balance is right, uh, the weight's good. Materials dense, so that's going to work just fine. So I'm going to start uh, splitting out some bits. I got a few split out this morning. I might just talk for a moment about what goes on here. So anybody who makes bows will have shafts that they dry. So they're sort of triangular pieces. So you can see the radius of the log here. So the ribs have to come out this way. Um, they they can't come off off the wood this way. Or they'll break when you when you steam them. So this guy, I'll probably get uh, two, possibly three ribs out of that one piece. So I've got to do that with all of them. And um, like I say, uh, you when you're splitting, and I've demonstrated this in past uh, episodes, um, you basically take the logs, split it in half. Um, so I've done that. I've split this guy. This was a half, and then I split the halves into quarters. And, and if need be, the quarters and eights. But these are going to do, I'm going to let them dry for a, maybe a couple of weeks before I start to use my fro to uh, bust out the ribs. And I'm going to split one out here and demonstrate how I do it. So the longer logs I have out here, they're going to be the sheathing. And it's the sheathing that gives a birch bark canoe its strength. People think they're fragile. Uh, but a properly built one, the only fragile spot is the bow and the stern. You can literally flip it over on its, on its uh, gunnels and take a baseball bat to it. You cannot, you cannot harm it. So the sheathing goes, um, uh, it lines the canoe longitudinally. And then the ribs, which are over here, and these are the shorter materials. So the, the ribs are going to get first um, split out of logs and then split with the fro into rough pieces, then trimmed out down to shape. And then the final step, we're going to sh um, steam them into into the right shape. We want the hull of the canoe, and they get driven in across the longitudinal sheathing. 
So that's where the canoe is going to get its strength. Anyway, I got a half of one done here and I thought I'd demonstrate how I'm going to split this out. And then uh, in a couple of weeks I'll be able to start uh, throwing out the uh, ribs. So over the years I've, I've had a lot of um, older people that have mentored me and and I always find it fascinating because old people know stuff <laughs> and and I can always learn from them. Not, I'm not saying you can't learn from young people but sometimes we just sort of discount our elders and and the knowledge that they have over uh, the, the time they've been on this planet absorbed and contained in their brains so yeah so one of the sayings the old timers say is if you're gonna peel a log you peel from the top down top to the base you're going to split a log, you split it from the base to the top. You don't tell me why, but it works. So, yeah, listen to our old people. They know stuff. Anyway, we're going to start off by splitting this guy in half. So I've got uh, my half split into half, so we're, we've got essentially got quarters now. So I'm going to split these again um, in half into eights. And those eights should give me two, possibly three uh, ribs out of each one of them. So if it splits really straight, and it's looking like this is excellent material, um, I should get six ribs out of this one piece. Hmm. So, uh, thought I was t done tool making for the day, but apparently not. Seems like I spent half my life making handles. Anyway, maybe I can make this doodle I get this guy split. 